Thank you, Harrison. Good to see you all, Madison. We love you and our traditional venue as well. Uh, wherever you might be, grab your Bible. Open, please, to the book of Acts chapter 5. Acts chapter uh, 5. If you're brand new, we're going verse by verse through the, the book of Acts. Today we are in the fifth chapter. The sermon series is called Unstoppable because the early church was unstoppable because we serve an unstoppable God. I hope you've had a good fall break, uh, but kids, kids, school starts tomorrow, uh, back in school tomorrow. So, so just to get you ready for school, maybe we should start the sermon with a little bit of math. Yes, there was a little boy and, and he had math homework and specifically word problems. Remember parents doing math word problems? Well, uh, he ended up with a very interesting answer to the math word problem. Turn your attention to the screens. Jaden has one dollar bill, one quarter, and two pennies. How how much money how much money does he have? Jaden broke. <laughs> Jaden. <laughs> uh, uh, okay, that's not the answer the teacher was looking for, but he's not wrong. <laughs> Jaden's broke. Uh, so, uh, in the book of Acts, first five chapters, we see a lot of math, Mo mostly addition. And I will show you. Acts chapter 1, verse 15, we start off, the early church does, with 120 believers in an upper room. 120. Acts 2.41 the Bible says that God added 3,000 who were saved and baptized on the day of Pentecost. In Acts 2.47, the Bible says God added daily those who were being saved. Then in Acts 4.4, 4, God added and added, and now there are 5,000 in the early church. But when we get to Acts chapter 5, God subtracts. He subtracts. Uh, two people are going to be subtracted from the church in a very dramatic fashion. So when God does math, he does addition, subtraction, he does multiplication. But there's one thing God never does. He never does division. God never divides a church. People do that. God adds, he multiplies, and sometimes he subtracts. But the reason he subtracts is to avoid division. And in Acts chapter 5, we're going to see some subtraction. Uh, in the first two major themes, we'll look at death, we'll look at healing. That's your sermon title. So just a two-point sermon, but multiple sub-points. Let's get started. Number one, let's talk about two funerals. God exposes hypocrites to protect his church. We will read the story, and when we're finished... Uh, we'll, we'll make some application. Let's get started. Chapter 5, verse 1. Now, a man named Ananias, together with his wife Sapphira, also sold a piece of property. The reason it says they also sold a piece of property is because he, he's connecting us to chapter 4. In the last sermon, we saw in chapter 4 where certain individuals in, in the early church would sell a house or would sell a piece of property, take the money from that and give it to the church. In this way, there were no needy people among them. Uh, chapter 4, verse 36 mentions this one man in particular, and he sold a piece of property, gave everything to the church, and, and the church was so encouraged, they actually gave him a nickname. They said, from now on, we're going to call you Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. So everybody praised Barnabas the encourager. Now we come to chapter 5, and we meet a husband and wife named Ananias and Sapphira. We continue reading in verse 2. With his wife's full knowledge, he kept back part of the money for himself, and, but, but brought the rest and put it at the apostles' feet. Then Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept for yourself some of the money you received for the land? Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? 
What made you think of doing such a thing? You've not lied just to human beings, but to God. When Ananias heard this, he fell down and died died and great fear seized all who heard what had happened some of you are new believers you didn't see that coming he drops dead verse six then some young men came forward wrapped up his body and carried him out and buried him so uh, why did they bury him right away uh, don't don't they need to contact the funeral home and, and make some sort of arrangements? At that time, Jewish people did not embalm their dead. And as a result, often they would bury the deceased on the exact same day that they died. They actually buried him pretty quick. Uh, notice verse 6 says, young men came forward and carried him out. The Bible is very specific. N- mentioned they were young men. Why? Well, I I think it's because, very practically, it was because a human body is heavy. I I remember I was conducting a funeral in Texas, and the the deceased was a godly man in his mid-80s. Most of his closest friends were also in their 80s, and these were the men who were selected to be pallbearers. So... We, we, we get to the cemetery, and the 80-year-old pallbearers are carrying the casket from the hearse to the grave. But I could tell that they're struggling a little bit with the weight of the body and the weight of the casket. And then one of the guys stumbles. And when he does, he lets go. The casket is starting to fall. I'm a few feet away, but I reach over. I grab the handle. I prevent the casket from hitting the ground, but it was such an awkward angle, something popped in my back. I mean, it was bad. For for the next few years, I I had back issues. I was getting injections in my back. I'll never forget going to the orthopedic doctor, and, and he looked at me and starts laughing out loud. He says, in all of the years I've practiced medicine, I've never had anybody write down that they had casket injury. <laughs> In hindsight, I wish I let the casket fall. He's about to get put underground anyway. But, uh, okay, there's nothing for you really to write down at the moment. Somebody's writing in their notes. I, I, I can only guess that they're saying, okay, i got to plan my funeral. Make sure I have at least two young people because I don't want anybody dropping me. Uh, anyway, uh, th- th- this is how I read my Bible. I noticed little things like that. They were... There were young men. So Ananias is dead. He's buried. His wife doesn't know. Look at verse 7. About three hours later, his wife came in. Three hours. They buried him quick. His wife came in not knowing what had happened. Uh, How does she not know? The Bible doesn't tell us. Maybe she's off at the Jerusalem mall buying stuff with all the money they saved by lying to the church. Look at verse 8. Peter asked her, tell me, is this the price you and Ananias got for the land? Yes, she said, that's the price. Peter said to her, how could you conspire to test the spirit of the Lord? Listen, the feet of the men who buried your husband are at the door and they will carry you out also. At that moment, she fell down at his feet and died. Then the young, again, young men came in. And finding her dead, carried her out and buried her beside her husband. Great fear seized the whole church. First time we see the word church used in the book of Acts. And it says great fear seized them. Greek word for great is mega. I mean, they they were mega scared. You think? Okay, so who at Willowbrook this morning forgot to bring their offering? Are you getting nervous? Actually, this, <laughs> this is not a story about giving. It is not. I'll show you that in a moment. Uh, ours is a God of love, but he's also a God of justice. He is holy, and he protects his church. It's kind of sad that the first two funerals in the early church were funerals of hypocrites who experienced judgment like this. Let me give you two applications to jot down. Number one. Those who cause division will incur God's judgment. Now, 
as I said, don't make the mistake and think that this story is about people who did not give enough money. That's not what it's about. They didn't have to give anything if they didn't want to. Peter says as much in verse 4. He says, the property belonged to you before you sold it. After you sold it, the money was yours. You could do whatever you wanted. The issue was not that they held money back. The issue was they lied about it. The issue was they were hypocrites. And I know it seems like a very dramatic thing that God would judge them in this way. I mean, literally kill them. But here's what you need to understand. The church was in its infancy. And it was under attack. And so God had to protect his church. This is not just a story about a couple of liars. This is, this is a scheme of Satan himself. How do I know? Look at verse 3. Peter said to Ananias, How is it that Satan has so filled your heart? This is the first time we see Satan mentioned since the cross. Uh, but make no mistake, he's been around. Uh, in the first four chapters of the book of Acts, Satan has been attacking the church from the outside. And it doesn't work. Peter and John got arrested, thrown in prison. The church kept growing. They threatened the apostles. The church kept growing. They tortured them. The church kept growing. The church was unstoppable. So the devil decides, if I cannot defeat the church by attacking from the outside, I'll just try attacking them from the inside. Remember what we saw in chapter 4. Uh, Barnabas generous man bought sold the property gave the money away the church praised him gave him a good nickname you're the encourager and so don't you know the devil begins to whisper in the ears of Ananias and Sapphira hey hey look at Barnabas look how the church is praising him <gasps> wouldn't you like them to praise you like that wouldn't you like them to all think that you're that spiritual and ananias and sapphira are thinking yeah they they loved the approval of people but they also loved money so, so how can we get the approval of people and not have to let go of our money the devil says, just lie. Just lie about it. T tell the church that you're giving them everything from the sale of the property, but then you hold back as much as you want. And so that's what they did. I can hold on to my money and maybe also get the praise of people. Had Peter not been discerning, Ananias and Sapphira could have become very influential people in the early church. And then when the devil attacked, he's not doing it from the outside. Then he'd be able to do it from the inside and create division. And, and I know what you're thinking. It, it, it seems so dramatic to, to have that kind of a severe judgment. But, but remember that the church was young. I mean, the church is only a few weeks old. And the devil's trying to wipe it out. God had to protect his church. Can you imagine if God dealt with hypocrites in churches today the way he did back then? I mean, we'd have, we would have to build a morgue at every church and put a mortician on every staff. Thankfully, that, that's not how he works today. I remember when I was a pastor in Texas before I came here. I was preaching through the book of 1 John. And I got to chapter 5, where it talks about a sin that leads to death, uh, 1 John 5, 16. And I explained to the church, there, were, there was a sin so severe that there were some people who actually died. Uh, Cross-reference, 1 Corinthians eleven thirty, where again, uh, there, there could be someone in such rebellion against God causing division in the church that, that there were some people who were judged like this, they died died. And then I said something like, but God doesn't do that to people today. The next morning, I was in my office at the church, and a godly senior adult in the church by the name of E.N. Irwin, uh, that, that's a picture of this dear fella, I hear a knock at my door. And he said, Pastor, I'd like to tell you a story if you have a minute. I said, sure. It's in reference to your sermon yesterday. Okay. You talked about God not taking people out these days. 
he, he said two pastors before you, the church had a big vote. And the vote passed, but there was some opposition. And, and one man who was opposed was so angry, he actually took a swing at the pastor who ducked. But nevertheless, it, it, he got violent. The next day, that man and three of his friends filed a lawsuit against the pastor and against the church because they did not get their way in the business meeting. Pastor, within a week, one of those men dropped dead of a heart attack. And these men were not old. They were middle-aged. And within a week of that, another one of those men had a massive stroke and spent the rest of his life in a nursing home. On the heels of that, a third guy uh, had an emergency medical situation, and they had to rush him to Good Shepherd Hospital. And, and as they're rushing him to the hospital, the fourth guy got in his car and rushed to his attorney and said, Drop the case, drop the case, drop as fast as you can. Drop the case. He said, Pastor, I know you said it never happens, but I saw it happen at this church where you are the pastor. Those who cause division in the church is a serious issue to Almighty God, and they will incur His judgment. Sometimes it happens in this life. If it doesn't, it will happen in the next. Now, before you decide that God is being uh, unfairly harsh with Ananias and Sapphira with this judgment, let, let me ask you a question. How would you... How do you think God should treat the Palestinian terrorists in Gaza who have been murdering and kidnapping hundreds of Israelis in the last 24 hours? You're aware of the war. Israel has declared war. Uh, these Palestinian terrorists from Gaza, the Hamas, that they've walked into homes in villages in southern Israel and just shot entire families of people. They've... They're, they're, as, as many as we know right now, there are over 600 dead. There are thousands wounded. They, they've taken hundreds more hostage into Gaza. Uh, they've fired thousands upon thousands of missiles. And I, uh, I've got a dear friend over there. Some of you know him. Uh, his name is Eliav Kampusta. He is the Israeli tour guide that I now use when I take groups to Israel. I, I was with him in May with 55 of you. That's a picture of Eliav and, and, his, and his beautiful family. I, I've been communicating with him back and forth. He's telling me things in real time that, 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 that we're not hearing on the news. I, I, I talked to him at 3.30 in the morning last night, our time, because they're eight hours ahead. I, I, should, be, I should be so tired. I'm not. But I, 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 need, I wanted to just make sure he's okay and he's he's telling me what's happening his bombs are exploding over our home well the missiles are being shot but Israel has an anti-missile defense system it's called the Iron Dome and the Iron Dome is is taking out most of the missiles but not all of them some of them are getting through but the the, the missiles are hitting each other literally exploding above his home and he he's in the reserves he's he believes he's about to be called up I actually uh, I didn't plan on sharing any of this but 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 I, or I'd be better prepared, but I'm, I'll just play you, get a sense of it, one of the messages that he shared with me, and I'll just hold my phone to the mic. This, this is Eliav. Hey, Pastor. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for sending a message. It's, the prayer is very important. And the situation in the meanwhile looked bad, very bad. Uh, I don't want to go into conspiracy theory, but it is and the verb of impossible what happened it's a uh, it's too many coincidences that caused the terrorist achieve so much goals we have more than a, we have few hundreds kidnapped already into gaza still fighting in cities and and uh, and villages in in the border of gaza uh, they start to recruit a lot vast part of the reserve uh, if they will recruit me meaning there is a global war here including the north my my uh, my position is in the north so they yet to recruit me there is bombings on top of our house as well uh, but the iron dome blowing them and the uh yeah continue to prayer my daughter is a bit afraid 
because of all the bombings. And she's uh, the oldest daughter. She's a bit, uh, yeah, she's a, she's a bit afraid. We're we're working on it. You know, fall asleep. But she was all crying kind of most of the day, and continue to pray for the peace of Israel and that the glory of the Lord will be shown through all of this. I'm sure that's what's going to happen eventually. That's my friend Eliav, and. Uh, I hope you could understand. Um, he talked about his daughter, his oldest daughter, this little beautiful blonde-haired little girl. She, she just cries all day long. She can't sleep because the bombs are going off. And as when Hezbollah gets involved, they're in the north. They've already lobbed in a few missiles, he told me, at 3.30 in the morning. And then they'll call him up as well. He's in the reserves, but that's when they will call him up. And I can only imagine if he's worried about his family now, how he's going to feel when he's fighting terrorists and wondering how his family's doing at home and if the missiles that are flying overhead are being taken out or if one of them possibly gets through. And, and, and all I can ask for you as a church is, is to please pray for the peace of Israel, pray for Eliav and his family. I've told him repeatedly that we are praying but I, I had an idea, maybe uh, I could do a quick video and he can, he can see that, that you're praying. And, and so what I want to do is I'll just start the video and, and then when I turn it towards you, if you could just let him know that you're praying with, with, with all kinds of loud applause, I know that would encourage him. So, so, so let's do that real quick. Um, Eliav, I'm, I'm in church, I'm preaching, this is service number seven. And in every service, we're asking our people to pray for you. There, there's your picture of your family right there. And, and we want you to know that we're praying for the peace of Israel. We're praying for you specifically. And, and, and the church is as well. Church family, are you joining us praying for Eliav? We stand with you. We are praying for you. You're not alone. Uh, thousands of us over here, at least at our church and other churches, we're lifting you up, brother, and waiting to see what good thing God is going to do. Thank you. I'll send that to him right after church. Uh, I, I know he'll be so encouraged. And, and, and I, I ask you to pray because they need it. And I, I, I bring it up at this point point because it it helps me understand this passage as well that hundreds of Israelis who, who are killed and hundreds more being held a hostage by terrorists and 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 no one in this room would have a problem with God bringing judgment down on these murderous terrorists who have attacked innocent women and children and 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 citizens of Israel no, they're trying to wipe Israel off the face of the earth. That is their goal. None of us would have an issue with God bringing judgment down upon them. Nor should we have an issue with God bringing judgment down upon Ananias and Sapphira in such a dramatic way. Because the devil is trying to wipe the church off the face of the earth. And the church in its infancy, just a few weeks old, the devil's trying to take it out. So when you're reading this, don't see it as, you know, Ananias and Sapphira who were greedy people told a lie, God killed them. That's not what this is about. See the story for what it really is. An all-out satanic attack on the early church trying to wipe it out. And, and that's why God responded the way he did. And that's why the judgment was as it, it, it was. God's protecting his church. He's protective of his church. Did you know the Bible describes the church as the bride of Christ? The bride. Men, if someone walked up to your wife and punched her in the gut, would you react? Would you defend her? You would protect your bride from attack. And, and that's what God's doing. We are his bride. And when someone attacks his church, he protects the church. And in chapter 5, he subtracted a couple of hypocrites so that the gospel would keep spreading. Now, I don't have time. I'll just let you fill in the blank. I didn't plan on sharing what I just shared. Uh, a second application, just write it down. Live like God is watching. 
Because he is. The story, ought, the story ought to be a reminder to you that God is a holy God and he takes hypocrisy seriously. We would live different lives if we really believed God is watching. Now, first half of the sermon is about death. Second half is about healing. Point number one, two funerals. Point number two, signs and wonders. So let's talk about that. Number two, signs and wonders. God healed disease to authenticate the gospel and its messengers. After you jot that down, we're going to continue reading in verse 12. The apostles performed many signs and wonders among the people. And all the believers used to meet together in Solomon's colonnade. No one else dared join them, even though they were highly regarded by the people. (laughs) Did you catch that? No one else dared to join them. Can, can you blame them? You have some lost couple, and the man looks at his wife and says, Sweetie, I know that church has a sign that says, All are welcome, but I hear people die over there. And so God's starting to weed out the hypocrites. But there are true believers that are coming to faith in Christ. Look at verse 14. Nevertheless, more and more men and women believed in the Lord and were added, Oh, good! good. We're back to addition. We subtracted a couple of people, but we're back to addition. More and more men and women believed in the Lord and were added to their number. Now get ready for some miraculous healing. Look at verse 15. As a result, people brought the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and and on mats so that at least Peter's shadow might fall on some of them as he passed by. Crowds gathered also from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing their sick and those tormented by impure spirits, and uh, some of them were healed. No, no, Bible says all of them were healed, and some of these healings were quite miraculous. Verse 15 says, they lined sick people up and down the street just so that Peter's shadow might fall on the sick person, and they would be healed. That's incredible. Later we will see in Acts chapter 19 that the Apostle Paul, when he was in Ephesus, they took a handkerchiefs from his body. And if the handkerchief touched somebody that was sick, they would be healed instantaneously on the spot. Now, just as God does not kill every hypocrite in the church today, we also could say that we don't see this Many miraculous healings uh, happening with as free, much frequency today either. I mean, uh, otherwise, I, I could just announce when church concludes, everybody meet me in the parking lot. And I'll be walking up and down the rows of cars. And you, you just wait till I get to you. And if, and if my shadow falls on you, then you will be healed. And we'll have crippled people jumping out of their wheelchairs. Whether you've got cancer, COVID, or the common cold, you'll be healed. Just get a little bit of the shadow. I, oh, I, I got a hanky. Let me wipe some sweat on it. Okay, I'll pass it around and y'all will all be healed. That doesn't happen today, does it? Well, why not? It happened then, why doesn't it happen today? At this time, God is healing diseases to authenticate the gospel and its messengers. Today, we have a completed Bible. We have the New Testament. They did not have that yet. So these miracles were God's way of authenticating the gospel. It was God's way of saying you can trust these preachers. Now, I I realize sometimes with the way we read the Bible, it it appears as if miracles were happening every single day. It's every page. But in reality, there have actually just been three periods of extensive miracles in all of Bible history. Uh, When God gave uh, his people the law, Moses performed signs and wonders. When God gave us the prophets, Elijah and Elisha also performed dramatic miracles. And then when God gave us salvation by grace and and ushered in the church aids, 
age, Jesus and the apostles began to do miracles. But here's what's interesting. Each of these three, three periods of miracles were less than 100 years in length. So during thousands of years of human history, there has been less than 300 years where we see these kind of miracles on such a frequent basis. Each time, it was God's way of saying, pay attention to these men. I, 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 I want to get your attention. I, he, he's authenticating the message and the messengers. But Pastor Mark, I'm sick. And I came to church and I want to hear more than that. Let me share with you three applications. Number one, in spite of all that I just said, number one, God has not stopped healing his people. He may not be using shadows and magic hankies, but God still heals his people. The Bible says in James 5, uh, 15, uh, that the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. That's what the Bible says. I believe the Bible. I believe God still heals his people, and I can give you testimony. I've seen him do it. When my dad was 48 years old, I come home from high school basketball practice, and, and my pastor's standing there in the house. Your father's had a stroke. He had a massive stroke. One side of his body paralyzed. He lost speech. They did a scan, and it showed brain damage. But 11 days later, my dad was acting perfectly normal. He could speak. The paralysis was gone. It didn't make sense. His doctor had to run another scan of his brain, and when he did, his brain was completely clear. There was no evidence of brain damage at all. He was, my, my dad was healed, and his, his physician looked at him, and never forget, he said, uh, Mr. McClellan, I don't know if you believe in God, but if you do, I would spend every day for the rest of your life thanking him for what he has done. I've been in medicine for 30 years. I've never seen what I just saw. I did not do this. Only God could have done that. I've seen it. When my wife was pregnant with my son, John Mark, she went to the OBGYN. It was a normal checkup for her ultrasound. And the doctor looked at us and he said, I'm so sorry. Jan, you, you've miscarried. All that you have is an empty gestational sac. And he showed us. We could see it on the screen. We saw what he saw. He said, I'm, you're, I'm sorry, to, but you're going to have to have surgery. You need to go to the hospital and have something called a DNC. They'll remove that tissue. And uh, we began to cry. I, I mean, we sobbed. But we also prayed. We, we said, God, you can do anything. Nothing is impossible with you. And later that same day, we went to the hospital for the procedure. It was in East Texas. They were fast. The same doctor who did the first ultrasound was in the room. And, and they were, before they put her under anesthesia to do the procedure, I, I said, I want another ultrasound. Oh, no, Mark, please don't, don't punish yourself. Mark, you don't, don't, no, I insist. Bef do, do another ultrasound before you. So they did at my insistence. And the doctor is staring at the screen for the longest time before he spoke. And then when he finally spoke, he just said, where did that come from? And then we looked. And it was not an empty gestational sack. It was my son. And then every, every Sunday I, I see him sitting on the second row, healthy, muscle-bound, weightlifter, happily married, great job at First Horizon Bank. He's living this blessed life. And, and it, it, we were that close to having them just remove him from the womb. And the doctor said, I can't explain it. And I said, I can. We serve a God 
who still heals his people, who answers prayer, and who loves little children. I've seen God heal again and again. My wife, sta- my wife, stage three, metastatic cancer, statistics of survival. She's 10 years cancer free. She's great. He touched my vocal cords. Do you, if you've been here, do you remember when I would preach all my sermons on Sunday and I didn't have a voice, a norm, it would take me till Thursday to recover before I could even speak normally. God, that's what I do. But he, he, he still heals his people. Three weeks ago in this service, River Baptism Day, I'm preaching. I'm near the end of my sermon, and all of a sudden, I get this stabbing pain. I mean, it was, it was bad. I was like wondering if I could finish the sermon. I got through the message, and then I don't know what's going on. I need to go to my office and put on a bathing suit. I need to go to the river and baptize people. I, and I'm thinking, is this, what a, is this what a ruptured appendix feels? What side is the appendix? I can't remember. And I'm in my car, and I'm driving you know, to the river, and I'm just praying, God, I've got to baptize people. But this really hurts. We just if it, if it's my appendix, don't let it rupture till I finish baptizing everybody. Please, God, I don't want to miss this. And I'm like praying. I get to the river. John Stone says, "I think maybe it's a hernia. I think maybe you popped a hernia when you were preaching." I, I was kind of fired up that day, but I mean, I'm thinking this is just what I need. I throw out my back conducting a funeral, and now I'm going to pop a, a hernia preaching. I'll be the laughing stock of the medical community. I, God, I just get me through the baptisms, and I'll go get it. Uh, but it really hurts. So I walk in the water, and we start baptizing, and we baptize. I'm worried. I'm lifting up full, you know, a full-grown adults. We baptize, and we baptize, and we, and we baptize. We, we baptize 70 people to the glory of God. And at the end of the day, I'm in my car, and I'm driving home, and suddenly it hit me. <gasps> It, it, qu- it doesn't hurt. I don't even remember when it quit hurting. Sometime when I was in the river. Wow. I mean, I was worshiping and as I'm driving. And what, what happened? Did God heal me? I, don't, I can't explain it all. But I can tell you I gave him all the glory. God still heals his people. If you have been healed, either miraculously or, or, or through the doctors and medicine, but you know God did it. If, if you are a loved one, if you've experienced at some point in your life, you are a loved one, the healing hand of God. I just would like, just lift your hand up. I just want to see. Look, look, I mean, that, it's a lot of testimony that he's the same God and he still heals his people. Okay, uh, i got to speed up. Application number two. Delayed healing is not a denial. Because I know some of you have been praying for years. Some of you have been praying for a lifetime for yourself or for a loved one. He may heal you immediately with his omnipotent power. Or... He may use medicine and doctors and treatment and chemo and time. Or he may wait until you go to heaven. But delayed healing is not a denial. How about the Apostle Paul? Remember him? God used him to miraculously heal so many different people. He's the guy with, with the handkerchief. So surely the Apostle Paul... Lived a healthy life. I bet he was never sick. I bet he never even got the sniffles. Not what the Bible says. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, the Bible tells us that Paul had something that he called a thorn in the flesh. It was a physical ailment. 2 Corinthians 12, 8 tells us that Paul pleaded with God three times, three times, begged God, take this away. And God ended up saying, my grace is sufficient for you. 
And a man who had healed so many other people did not experience healing in his own life. And maybe there's a clue for us earlier in that chapter, 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Paul talks about how he had a vision where he got to see heaven. God gave him a glimpse into paradise. And maybe the reason he was okay with delayed healing was because he knew, he knew that one of these days he's going to have a perfect body, a glorified body. We want everyone to be healed in this life, but even if they are and they become healthy, that person is just going to get sick again one day and end up dying. I told you that, that at the age of 48, my father had a massive stroke and God healed him. Then at the age of 76, he had another massive stroke and he died. The healing at the age of 48 was temporary. The healing at the age of 76 was permanent. Because when we go to heaven, isn't that ultimate healing? Look, I, I pray, I pray that God heals you in this life. I really do. I want that for you. But if your healing is delayed weeks, months, years, it's not a denial. And if your healing is delayed until heaven... All I can tell you is, it'll be worth it. You'll have a glorified body, a perfect body, and, and you'll never experience pain again. One more thought, application number three. The greatest healing of all is the transformation of a lost sinner into a child of God. Verse 12 says the apostles performed signs and wonders. Then you get to verse 14 and it says, More and more men and women were believing and being added to the family of God. Do you see that connection? There's a connection between the healing miracle and conversion. You, you see it all through the book of Acts. And I tried to share in the last service. I don't have time. But there's a connection. The, the greatest healing is not the healing of a sick body. The greatest healing is the healing of a sin-sick soul. When a body is healed it, and, and the sickness goes away, that's just temporary. But when your soul is healed and your sins are forgiven, that, that's forever. I'm telling you, the greatest miracle of all is the miracle of salvation. Ralph Smith was a dear mentor when I was a pastor in Austin, Texas. He's in heaven now, but I'll never forget the story he told me about a pastor in Texas named Bob Schuler. He was a pastor of a Baptist church, and his eldest son, Jack, was also called to preach, and he was, he was good. Uh, Jack had, was a trained Shakespearean actor, so when he preached, it was with a dramatic flair. He was so eloquent, people would always be on the edge of their seat. And one day, Jack was preaching in his dad's church, and when he extended the invitation, uh, his brother Phil starts coming down the aisle. And when Phil gets to the front, his father looks at him and says, Son, I know you're already a Christian, so tell me, why are you, why are you here? He wrote on a piece of paper, Dad, I've been called to preach. He held it up so his father could read. Why was he writing on a piece of paper? Uh, Phil had a terrible issue with stuttering. Uh, when he was a child, he'd fallen out of a hayloft. He'd hit the back of his head. And ever since then, uh, he, he could not talk without stammering. So he had just given up on speech altogether and he wrote things down. His father said, son, are you sure? Don't write it down. S speak. Yes, Dad. God's calling me to p preach. Now, how can you preach if you can't talk? I d d d d don't know. Dad said to his son, Jack, look, you talked him into it with your sermon. You need to talk him out of it. But Phil would not be dissuaded. And, and, and so someone heard about his call to preach, and they invited him to speak to the youth on a Wednesday night. Well, the word spread about the kid who couldn't talk was going to preach. A thousand people showed up. 
His father is praying, oh God, change his mind, please. I don't want my boy to embarrass himself. His father is sitting next to him uh, during the music and he leaned over and he said, son, are you okay? I'll do do the the best I can. Phil walked up on the platform, walked over to the pulpit, opened his Bible. There was a pregnant pause. And then he said, open your Bibles, please, to the Gospel of John, chapter 3, verse 16. Today I'm going to preach to you on the wonderful love of God. God's love is awesome. There was no stutter. God leaves, loves each and every one of you. There was no stammer. He went to the cross to prove it. He never missed a beat. He preached the entire sermon, never stuttered once. When the sermon was over, he's standing at the front. People are walking up to him, and he can't talk without stuttering but ever since that day when Phil stands up to preach the gospel he preaches with perfect diction when he speaks he stammers but when he preaches it is with perfect articulation I heard him preach and it, over the course of his ministry it's been estimated thousands of people have given their lives to Christ because of that gift uh, th- th- that's the kind of God that we serve And do you see the connection? A a miracle and conversions. God gave him the gift of speech while he preached so people could receive the gift of eternal life. That's the greatest miracle of all. Today I want to pray. If you're ill, if you're sick, if you need a physical touch, I'll pray for you. We'll see what God does. But there's a miracle I can guarantee. I can guarantee it. I can promise God will deliver. If you don't know Christ as Savior, if you come to Him today in faith and confess your sin, I guarantee you will be healed. Healed of sin. Delivered from darkness. Forgiven. Set free. Made an adopted child of God with an eternal destiny one day in heaven. That's a miracle. I can promise every one of you. Let's have a miracle today. Father God, thank you for Willowbrook. Thank you for this church. Thank you for your, your, your holy touch. Physically, you, you've delivered so many of us, but spiritually even greater. You've set us free by the blood of Jesus Christ. Do it again. Draw people to yourself. Do it today. Now, I pray in the strong name of Jesus. And everyone said, you're saying amen. That means you agree. So be it.